Well, this is working really well. We're, we're sticking right on time to the minute, so I'm, I'm amazed. Um, with that uh, challenge there, I'm going to hand over to, to Russell uh, Wheatland now, who's going to explain to us why uh, uh, his area of sea grey is, is both interesting and important. Um, I won't steal his thunder. I'll, I'll let him explain that. Thanks, Russell. I'll do it, this one? No. Wrong way. Wrong way. There we go. Good morning. I'm Russell Wheatland. I'm the current convener of Seagray Panel AUB1, which is to do with insulated cables. A uh, tree tells a good story. He can generate all he wants, but you need a cable to bring it out into the, into the real world. So. Let me shed some light on that. Um, I'm not going to travel too much about the International Study Committee, although we'll touch on it. I'm uh, going to present to you what's happening in Australia with the B1 panel. Uh, we've actually got a bit of a combined panel between us and New Zealand. We've now got five Kiwi members. Uh, this is our photo. We've got 32 active members and we've taken on five in the last 12 months, which is really quite exciting as we reach out to all the utilities, we've got consultants and it's, it's terrific to get everyone in a room. It's challenging as a logistics thing, but it's great to be able to share what's happening around the, around the nation and New Zealand as well. And yeah, it's just good stuff. Uh, Seagray is now actively involved in uh, medium voltage. It's, it's traditionally been a transmission uh, group but now we're out into MV and they're, they're starting me to worry about whether we're going to move into LV. We don't want to do that. But anyway, we're in MV and we've got some members of our group that are just totally in MV uh, panels. And we're looking at developing a New Zealand group, uh, NGN, the next generation of Seagray. We've got some active involvement there and Phil is our representative from the NGN on AUB1. We've been involved in a few different things across the nation. Here's just a picture of some partial discharge occurring in a medium voltage accessory. Anybody that's involved in this will be well and truly familiar with challenges. Uh, and we're planning a cable accessory, uh, sorry, we're planning a cable seminar. It was going to be a 2019 seminar, but now it's 2020. And we feel that there's a lot of work happening around Australia with cables by people that don't know a lot about cables. So we thought we might try and educate Australia in what to look out for. It's not just a case of digging a hole in the ground and putting in a bit of pipe. There's actually some um, physics that need to go with that. Uh, HV and EHV cable systems uh, growing uh, as we rebuild different parts of our cities. Uh, well, there's a whole lot of not in my backyard happening now with Teco Savvy uh, customers that don't want towers sticking out there, so uh, get rid of the overhead, let's put it underground. Internationally, 500 kV underground is business as usual. Uh, that's AC. DC, they've settled at about 680 kV, but they're playing with 800 kV. Uh, so there's a lot of activity uh, around the world in DC links that are just going through from France through Belgium up north. And you go, poor old Belgium, you know, they just get caught in the way. Um, they don't have any input to this. This is just a link between here and here. And, there's, and I can show you some maps, but I'm not going to, just about the interlinking that's happening uh, around Europe. We, we have a little bit of that, but not a lot. Um, so there's a renewed pressure on age infrastructure replacement and our network, in, I work for Osnet Services in Victoria. Our network's been around for quite a few years now and as wind farms come on, as we're hearing, uh, the network needs to be boosted and how best to do that is a real challenge for a network. Uh, increased use of uh, gas insulated switchgear and the preferred entry option for GIS is cable, as it should be. Um, <laughs> renewable energy, we've seen these photos before. A significant investment in, in Victoria alone, we're talking five gigawatts. So it's just moving our whole total generation model
from down in the east of Victoria across to the west of Victoria. A network that used to, it, it runs a bit of fuse wire up there to feed a few customers. We're now putting five gigawatts worth of generation up there, so that poses a whole lot of new challenges to our network. And where cables come into that, well, who knows? But I meet fairly regularly with our system developers and planners to say, if you're thinking about it, we can put 220 underground quite happily. Oh, didn't know that. So there's a whole lot of education that needs to go on about where cables are at, uh, technology-wise. Uh, Snowy 2.0, you, you will know about. And that's exciting, because that's cable-driven, of course. Uh, Another link across the Tassie. That won't be an overhead line either. That will be a submarine cable. Um, and, you know, 1,500 uh, megawatts. There's a bit of power there, a bit of voltage, but business as usual for around the world. So there's, there's some good technology around. Commissioning renewable generation, uh, it's just relentless. And uh, this, I thought, was an interesting point. Developers demanding shorter implementation times, creating a cost versus engineering uh, challenge of doing it right or doing it cheap. To go from one 66 circuit with no redundancy to two 66 circuits, giving you some redundancy to a cheaper option of 10 33 kV circuits, direct buried. But why would you do that? because it's cheap, but it may not be the, the better engineering solution. Uh, certainly increased interest in actually commissioning testing, so partial discharge and at, at both transmission and distribution, and that's exciting for our testing people, but also uh, for our asset managers. New Zealand constructing and planning, 110 kV circuits. Uh, renewable energy in the distribution mode and like we're seeing so many solar panels, from a network point of view, there's reverse power flows happening around our network and how best to cope with that. But all of this comes with uh, different loads onto the cable networks. We've got harmonics floating around. We've got ups and downs and ins and outs. And as Tree, Tree said, you know, some, of this, uh, some of these assets are not built for heating up, cooling down, heating up, cooling down. It, it has a toll that will be taken. So we just need to be mindful of what's actually happening in our networks. So a stepped increase in capital expenditure over in New Zealand. New Zealand government sponsoring research on effective lava flows. I was involved in a Seagray working group on major disturbances uh, for underground cables and lava. You know, nothing gets away from it. It just cooks everything. Bushfires, very few reported effects on underground cables, except where they come up to have to meet with this overhead stuff. But, um, but lava, nothing escapes. <laughs> and a focus on reducing system outages. So I think that's quite a, a utility thing there. We have, as I've said, an active Australian panel. We're involved in 12, 13, 14 working groups from B1. And these are some of the topics. And I thought I'd yeah, just have this slide in front of you. So you can see that we're over a whole lot of different things. And some task forces. A task force is something that's raised by the study committee. And in, there's 16 of those. But the study committee will see a request come in to, is there uh, work to be done in a particular field? So let's pick on the last one there, status detection, condition monitoring, and rejuvenation for power cables. So the study committee, not knowing whether or not there's enough in this, will create a task force that will run for one year. It will uh, bring a whole lot of people from around the world together to discuss whether or not there's enough meat in this topic to move to the next step of creating a working group and a working group typically runs for two years, possibly three, but they're aiming at two, to really get some uh, work done around a particular topic. So that's the difference between working groups and task forces. Just to help you there. Uh, international activities, the AORC, the uh, Asia Oceania Regional Committee, and I'll speak a little bit about that as time goes by. Uh, this year we met in Bali 
It was well chaired by the Japanese chairman at this stage. Australia plays a, plays a very active part in the AORC. And you can see at the top there that Australia has attended every one of these meetings. In fact, the B1 panel for the AORC was created by our own Ken Barber from here. And so Australia has really driven it. And uh, Japan's up there too. So that's why they are the... Uh, we chaired it for 10 years. Ken, Ken chaired it for 10 years and then handed it over to uh, Japan. Next year it gets handed over to China and then it will come back to one of the other countries. Uh, we talked about it in the National Committee yesterday. Uh, providing a link with growing regional countries that possibly can't make it into the sea grey major circles in Paris and what have you. Uh, right, we coordinated with the, the technical meeting. Uh, uh, Rob Stevens is the, uh, uh, the CEO of Seagray and it was great to spend some time with him. There was also a cable conference in Paris called G Cable and we actually had four of our members from the AUB1 that attended, which was just great. Last year, or last time, every four years it happens. Last time I was there on my own, this time we had uh, four of us, so it was really good. Just like to finish my time here with talking about the AORC. Uh, and fundamentally, this says that for countries that can't get to be involved in Sea Gray in its entirety, the AORC gives a, a mirror of what's happening at the Sea Gray level. And for different countries, can't get involved for all sorts of different reasons. I, I see great strength in the AORC and what it can give to developing countries. Uh, the existence of regions has no impact on the governance status of Sea Gray national committees, and, uh, nor does it introduce any hierarchical notion. It's just people getting together in that country or from around the area. So there are four uh, regional committees from Sea Gray, and here they are, and you can see that we have a very particular group with the AORC because we have two of the big superpowers of the world involved in it. We have China and India. And so it brings a whole dynamic to the meeting that I think uh, Australia really helps to uh, filter through. So I didn't really know what the Gulf Cooperation Council was, so I thought I'd get myself out a map. And they are the countries that are involved in the AORC. And if this pointer works, there's a whole lot of little island countries over here that aren't yet represented. So I think there's some work that the AORC can do to really bring in a little bit more of this. So, yeah, and that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you.